Hello, my name is Isaiah and welcome to another video here at OverclockersClub.com. This is our YouTube channel and in this video I'm going to talk about the RTX 3060 Ti. Ooh, that's a lot of words. Uh, this is the overclocking guide for it. Uh, the review, you can always find it in the description below, but this video is really about overclocking the video card. I have a founder's card right here and I also have the custom MSI Gaming Trio X card that I also reviewed. Both are good in their own sense. Uh, this is MSRP of 400. Obviously, it's a little bit harder to find right now as I made this video, and this is a custom card from MSI. Once again, hard to a little bit find right now. But in this video, what we're going to do is get the most amount of performance out of the video card. Uh, that is the point here is that you're paying money for a video card, and you can always get a little bit more performance. It depends on what you're doing. And that's what we're going to go through here. For those who are wondering, uh, this guide kind of covers how I go about overclocking it myself for the reviews because I want to see, you know, obviously it's stock, what it works looks like and when it's overclocked, how it performs and why buy a custom card? Uh, is it better for cooling? Is it better for overclocking? Is it neither? So those are the kind of things I have to go through when I write reviews. And then when it comes to the overclocking part, well, it's pretty standard how to do it. There's multiple ways, and in this video, I'm going to show you the kind of the easiest get your feet wet kind of overclocking guide because there's so many different variations. You'll find 15 videos about how to do the same process. So I'm just going to show you the way I think is useful. All right. So right before we get started here, I want to say I really do enjoy the comments people leave on the YouTube videos, especially the ones that are kind of funny to me. I know I don't smile a lot, so I actually have a hat here to wear to generate some comments. And uh, while I'm talking about that with a hat on, uh, you can go on our Twitter page and our Facebook page for Overclockers Club, and also you can follow me personally on my Instagram page if you really, really want to. It's on the description below. I don't post much stuff, but I got a cool picture of a hat like this on there. So. Anyways, let's go ahead and overclock this video card. Now we're on the computer, let's go ahead and talk about the software I use and from there we'll go over the overclocking part. Now I'll just timestamp in the description and the time bar will show me where you're going but uh, I'm going to cover a lot of different subjects so feel free to jump around and of course any settings I use won't be directly usable it'd be a good starting point but obviously your video card is going to be different and you're going to achieve a different results so my goal here is to show you how I go about getting these results for my overclocking guides and my reviews and then you can apply that to your situation also. So the first thing I like to do is talk about the four programs I use. I use more than that but this is a good starting point and you know all these are free and that's why I like to recommend them. First is MSI Afterburner which is the program that will allow you to change your settings as far as your clock speed and all that. MSI Combustor which is basically a program that puts a full load on your video card uh, no matter what card you have so it really kind of puts a puts a heavy load on it which is more than any game would do I noticed it so if you run this program you're gonna have a higher load than what games do so when you get stability issues in this program you get you know you're definitely gonna have stability issues in games or sorry actually the other way around if you get stability issues in this but you might not get it in games depending on how you have it set up and then Heaven Benchmark is just a free program that is a looping, which can help. It's kind of outdated now because it doesn't put a heavy load on anything, but it's a good starting point. And then Hardware Info, I like to use Hardware Info because it kind of gives you everything. So it allows you to make sure that you know other things in your system is not giving you problems. So if you have a system crash, of course you want to make sure your whole system is stable before overclocking, but sometimes little issues sneak up on you, you didn't realize it. So say you're pushing your video card and it's drawing a lot more power, well maybe your power supply couldn't handle that and your computer's actually crashing. So you can sometimes investigate here to find out what might be the culprit. Maybe you're gonna find that your CPU is actually 
higher voltage than it want, or you're drawing more power, a higher temperature, whatever it is, this program can kind of help you with that. Now, I generally don't leave it open or running unless I run into issues, but it's a good way to look through your whole entire system. And I do have a video for tech power ups version of this program that does power consumption. And both these programs are pretty accurate. So if they are saying they're pulling, you know, uh, 18 watts or whatever, it really is pulling around that wattage. So it kind of helps you determine how much power your video card is actually drawing. Okay, so let's go ahead. Now I talked about what programs I use. Let's go ahead and fire up Afterburner. So this is what you're going to be greeted with first. Afterburner, uh, every time you download it every year, they have a different version. So depending on what version you're downloading, it's going to look different. So I like I don't like this version, the way it looks. It's just a skin, but I don't like it because I'm just used to the old version, honestly. Uh, everything's in a different spot than I'm used to, but it it still functions safe. You want to leave it this way. So what I'm going to do is actually change it. So once you find your gear symbol, whatever version you're on, if you have a gear symbol, and then you want to go all the way over to user interface. At the bottom of user interface, there'll be the skins here. And I'm going to set mine to cyborg white. I just prefer that. And then you can have opacity. I like to make sure it's opaque so you can't see through it just for recording purposes. Skin scaling is going to be uh, how large the GUI is here. So if you're at 4K monitor, if you leave it 100%, it's going to be really small. And then if you scale it up to 200, and that's why 4K looks like that. So this is what it's going to look like afterwards. Okay, so now we have this new version up, which is the same thing, it's just everything got moved around. We're going to go back to the gear symbol, and we're going to make sure we can unlock the voltage, and we're going to make sure we can see the voltage. Now, unlocking the voltage, I've talked about this in my other guide for the 3080, is that pretty much this bar is just superficial. It doesn't really do anything anymore. It's, uh, it's a blast from the past that NVIDIA has left in there, or I guess uh, MSI has left in there for compatibility reasons. So if you have an older video card, this slider actually does something, but not really any of the newer cards. I think Turing doesn't do anything with it. I, I believe it does something with the Pascal. So if you have like a 1080 Ti or whatever, this does something, but it doesn't do it anymore. Uh, I do. I still, I still like to unlock it just because of the off chance it does something. But I am pretty sure it doesn't because I investigated this pretty thoroughly. So yeah, voltage unlock control. I just leave it on MSI standard. I don't know what the other ones do. They don't seem to make a difference. And then unlock voltage monitoring, which unlocks this. You hit apply, and it's going to ask you if you want to restart the program. Of course, you're going to say yes. And bam, we're up. Now we have the program up and running. We have everything unlocked that I want to use. Now we can actually go ahead and talk about what each one of these sliders does. So it really will help you understand how overclocking works for these video cards. Uh, once again, if this part bores you or already know about it, you can always skip ahead and I'll have it in the timeline. So to continue on here, what each one of these does is it kind of has a different application. So once again, I talked about it briefly, core voltage has a hundred percent I put in the quotation marks I believe this does nothing anymore because you can have a hundred percent you can have a zero percent and the voltage doesn't change at all as far as you know being lower or higher so you leave it at hundred percent but in the past your percentage your voltage and the maximum voltage these cards can do without modifying them is 1.196 volts I believe and uh, that is the limit of the card and you'll find that the cards kind of fluctuate between 1.16 and 1.169, and it kind of goes around. And that depends on how much power draw the card's using, how much the temperature the card is, all these other factors that kind of determine the voltage. And the slider does nothing really. Next is your power limit. Now, power limit is going to be different per card because I have a custom MSI Trio X card here. And you can see how it says 100%, and then you can see how it goes when it goes 104%. Now, if you have this, the Founders Edition, it goes 100%, and then it goes to 110%. Instinctively, you think, well, 110% is higher than 104%. That is true 
in a linear fashion, kind of like just looking at it, but your base number 100 is different per card. So 100 for this card is actually 240 watts and 100 for the other card is 200 watts. So there's a 40 watt difference and they both start at 100. So when I put, put this to 104%, that means this card draws a 250 watts total or maximum you can draw, I should say. And then when I put it to 210% for the other card, which is the Founders Edition, I get 220 watts maximum. So that's the discrepancy there. So when somebody says my card only goes to 102%, 104, 110, that doesn't matter. It's what the base number is and what your maximum power is. So in this case, 250 is the maximum this card can pull. And you can find this out actually pretty easily. So if you either you can go and pull up, you know, your favorite program like Tech Power Ups, GPU Z, and you go under sensors, you can see power draw right here. And I think under advanced, it might say it. Sometimes it it has in the past, but it doesn't seem like it has it listed anymore. It would be right around here. But you can easily monitor it while you're running your program. Uh, down here, you can see it's, it's going to be somewhere. Huh? Power percentage, power draw right here. And so quickly, I'm not going to go into this program yet, but if I were to just put a load on this video card, you can see the power draw has gone up. I'll have to hit apply. See, once I hit apply, 250 is the max, where 240 was the max before. And here you can see it's drawing about 250. So uh, obviously they're hanging the video card at different times, so the numbers aren't going to be exactly the same, but 250 is the limit of this card, and you can see it bounces off 250. Let's close that for a second. So that's one way to determine what your power draw, or maximum power draw is. And then next you have your temperature limit. And temperature limit really just means what it is. It's, it's the maximum temperature the video card is allowed before the clock speed drops off. If you go into this curve editor, which I'll talk about in a bit also, by default, once the card passes about 85 degrees Celsius, the clock speed automatically dips down to safety mode. See, it's way down here in 1300 because, or 1400, because that's the safety of the card. Now it'll keep going down past this, but most likely <laughs> your card will never get, you know, that hot where it's 90 degrees Celsius and your fans at hundred percent. Cause your fans will ramp up. That's another thing you have, uh, except for auto, but say in this program or any other program, you can adjust your fan curve. So automatically in the BIOS of the video card, it has its own fan curve, which kind of looks like this. You could always use software to have its own fan curve. But either way, you know, once it hits 80 degrees or so, it's going to ramp up the fans to the highest it possibly can to stop it from overheating. And, of course, NVIDIA has safeties in the card, so you're never really going to ever damage the card if you use it properly. If you remove the heat sink completely and run the card, you will blow it out really fast, but nobody does that. That covers temperature limit. I usually like to raise it to 90 because AES makes that offset higher. So when the card does start getting to 80 degrees, it won't start down clocking because really it won't down clock until 90 now instead of 80 before. Let's talk about what this does. Why, what, what does power limit and temperature limit have anything to do with the video card itself? Of course, if you put a load on your video card and you're allowed to draw more power, that would indicate that you can have a higher clock speed. And we can kind of see this a little bit in Combustor. I don't think this is the best program to show you, but I will give you a quick example of this. So I was going to use Combustor as an example, but it's not going to be a very good example of how your power limit affects your, your clock speed. So let's go ahead and fire up Cyberpunk. It's going to be a good example of how this works. Here's my first example. We are playing at 4K resolution, and obviously the frame rate's not very good. That's not really the purpose of this video here. And my clock speed is jumping between 1920 and 1935. If I were to change that to 1080, you can see the clock speed is now 1950. And that is just by changing the resolution 
nothing else. It's just still a stock setting. So depending on how much your video card is drawing in power, can also determine your clock speed. And it's hard to explain that better, so let's go ahead and go back to 4K and give you a better example of what I mean. If I go and I raise the power limit and all those, now my clock speed is jumping between 1935 and 1950, it goes down to 1920, depending on your temperature is how it's fluctuating there. But let's go ahead and give you a better example. If I drop this down to a 70 power limit, we don't want to we don't want to drop the temperature down. You can see how the clock speed has dropped all the way down to 1700, 1725 or so, and that's because it is not allowed to draw more than 70% of this power limit. Which means if you go here, you can see that the voltage is a lot lower, and therefore the clock speed lower. If you go here. Basing your voltage, so your voltage is 1900, and you can see your voltage is literally bouncing off what the limit is allowed. And that's how your target power target can dictate how much your video card draws, and it also can dictate, which like I said, this is no longer a real thing, the slider here, but if your slider was working, if you have an older video card and it actually did something, uh, this can also dictate your limit. So if you can't go to 100% voltage, which would be right around here, if you can't go to 100% voltage, then your clock by default speeds will never go that high. And that's my reasoning behind why uh, people might have different results. So you say I got 2100 in your, in your results. Well, did you get 2100 out of the box because you have a higher power target? You get 2100 because your card's cold and it hasn't warmed up, and once you warms up, it, the clock speed drops because the temperature has risen. There's lots of little factors that can determine your clock speed. Now, I'm not saying that the aftermarket cards like that MSI Gaming X or any of those really high-end video cards uh, are falsely telling you something because definitely if you're, you have a beefier cooling system, you have a beefier power delivery, then you're going to have a uh, better or overall higher clock speed generally. Now, obviously, your quality of a GPU can matter there. So let's talk about the new feature that's been, uh, not, not super new, but it's been around for a little bit. It's called the auto OC function, which basically sounds what, it's, what it sounds like. It, it automatically overclocks the video card, and then it saves a profile, allows you to pretty much not have to worry about overclocking it manually, it does it for you, which is great. Um, but there's some caveats to it, and we're going to talk about it quickly here. First, you need to have the newest version of MSI Afterburner. This is because the drivers themselves from M NVIDIA now have the function built into it, so you don't actually need this program to use it. Any program that supports this overclocking function will now pull it from the drivers instead of their built-in profile. Downside of that is it doesn't quite work. Right now, it kind of fails to work. So if I hit scan, I've been getting an error code, and I'm using newest drivers here. To be fair, usually it does work, and I actually have a profile saved here to kind of show you what it would look like. But if it does work, prepare to wait 30 minutes. It's gonna run through a whole test, and it can be like checking, checking, checking. I might have a video to cover that up to show you what I mean by that. But if I were to apply the curve it gave me, what this actually does is it, it checks every single point on this graph and then applies a offset. So here it's doing an offset at 137, here it's doing an offset at 111, 72, 73, 47, 45. And so what, what it's doing is it kind of sets an offset zero. See, it sets an offset based on what it thinks. So it grabs a point here, and basically it will raise it until it crashes or until it arrows out in the program, whatever scanning program it's using, and then it'll lower it until it's stable again. And that's roughly how this graph works. It's great when it works because it allows you to pretty much scan 30 minutes, set and go. You don't really have to worry about overclocking. I found it very very good at being close to a good uh, overclock. Now, of course, you don't have control over it. You could always go ahead and say, oh, you know what? I like this. 
graph, but I actually want it to be 77, where I want this one to be higher. You can, you can manually do that. Now, if I were to linearly overclock it, which we're gonna do in a bit here, and that's part of the video, is I've hit plus 30. Now you can see that the entire graph is 30 offset. All the points are 30 automatically. Now we know that like a point down here could be 140 or something like that, but the video card is just gonna generically offset this by 30. And if you notice when you're playing games, you're never really going below one volt because your card is under load. So really all the points below might, I don't know, it doesn't affect too much. I mean, it, maybe if you have a game that's not using a lot of processing power, it might help. But for the most part, a linear overclock is going to give you a more crude results, but also I would consider more stable because you know that no matter what, this is the highest it's going to go. Now we covered everything to do with how the card operates, how the overclock works, um, how your power draw is, all that stuff is covered. Now we can go into the linear overclocking, which is pretty much what this guide was about. And this is how I overclock. I don't use auto O scan when I do my reviews or benchmarks and all because every time you hit scan is going to give you a different result. And I can't use that. Uh, between multiple computers, I can't use that as a reliable source because while I could set every single, you know, bump on this graph, I'm not going to do that because it's a lot of work. And really, the outcome doesn't matter to me because, uh, or the lower numbers don't matter to me because ultimately, the highest a card can overclock is what I care about, not about, you know, can I get, you know, extra 100 megahertz out of 800 millivolts. I, that's not too important to me personally, and that's why I don't overclock it with auto scanner. I do check it to make sure it works, or if it doesn't work, or just to see how well it does, but generally when I'm doing review stuff, I don't do that. So the first thing I have to do when it comes to manually overclocking is you set the core voltage, power limit, and temperature limit, as we discussed earlier, Core voltage limit doesn't, or percentage, doesn't do anything anymore for these cards, the newest Ampere, and I don't think it does anything for the Turing cards either. Um, it's kind of a relic, but power limit clearly does something. If you lower the power limit, you get a lower clock speed because it has less power to draw. Less power means that your voltage is going to be lower, and then therefore your clock speed is going to be lower. This is how it works. Temperature, same thing. While you're probably not going to hit 80 or 90 degrees Celsius, having that higher number allows it to keep a higher clock speed longer. You can't go above 92 in the drivers, even if this is set for 90, you can't go above 92, it'll go into safety mode and turn off, or not turn off, but clocks down to like 100 megahertz or 200 megahertz. So really, unless you remove the heat sink and you try to run the video card, you're not gonna ever burn it out by having a higher temperature limit. You will degrade the chip over time and that's, you know, that's just a given. It doesn't matter if you do your CPU, it doesn't matter if you do your video card, anything that has a higher temperature will degrade faster. With out of the way, let's talk about actual overclocking. So what I like to do is I really do prefer to use combustor, MSI combustor, because it puts a full load on it. It puts a heavier load on it than any game. So even Cyberpunk that's 4K and your card can barely run it at 20 frames a second, this is an easier way to get the same results and you don't have to even run it 4K. So while I do suggest running it at the highest resolution your video card can allow, so if I do, for example, if I do 1080, you'll see that the clock speed, it'll eventually drop down, but the clock speed is 1950 or so, and maybe it'll drop down to 1935 or so. There it goes, 1935, 1950, and it'll go bounce around. If I were to put this at 4K, 4K, you'll see instantly the clock speed is going to be lower. Why is this? Once again, it has to do with how much power your video card is allowed, how heavy the load is on your video card, and uh, your temperature and all that stuff. So if your video card 
is struggling to keep up because it's such a heavy load on it, then it asks for, you know, more power. And if it doesn't have more power to be given to it, then it must deal with how much voltage it has. So you see, it's not pulling a whole, it's not pulling its full power, which is, you know, 1.06 or whatever voltage. It's because the video card actually is drawing more power. So we're probably, if you look at the power percentage, 250, and that's my example. So I do suggest running at the highest possible resolution, but at the same time, if you were to overclock with the highest resolution and you go play a game at 1080 or something, you'll find that suddenly your clock speed that was 1920 is now 2100 in your 1080 you know, P game. Do it 1080, see how high you can go. Go to 4K or whatever high, whatever the resolution of your monitor is, the highest your monitor goes, run that there. See how high you can go there, and then see which one is, you know, a happy number, whether it's your plus 50 or plus 60 or whatever you keep going until you find out. NVIDIA only allows 15 increments. And what I mean by that is that your boost speed is a number. So if you go zero here, I have a boost speed of 1935. If I add 15 to it, it'll go to 1950 because that's 15 on top of that number. And obviously it can drop down because once again, boost does its own thing. All you're doing is adding 15 on top of that boost number. And then 30, and basically what I like to do is I keep going up 15 at a time because if you type in 10, it's gonna either go up or down. It's not gonna be a even number and Nvidia only likes the 15s. I go up until the video card crashes. Once it crashes, then I go and clock it down maybe you know 15 maybe 30 and then start from there and kind of work off of that you could start from the base i really suggest doing that but a lot of people just want to jump in and say okay i can do 100 or whatever i saw i saw a review and it said 150 or whatever you can type those numbers in if you crash that's probably why you it's hard to know what crashed the computer if you're typing such a high number in right away i do know this card does 90 just fine it can go hours and hours and hours. If I do 100 and a 105, I found the video card after two or three hours will crash. If I play certain games, like Metro Exodus, it crashes it at 105, but 90 doesn't crash it. So it really depends on what game you're playing and resolution and all that. So that's, once again, why you want to try multiple speeds, multiple clock speeds, and test against games and test against benchmarks and all that. And ultimately, what you want to do is you want to have your base number from your benchmark, your game, and then you want to overclock it and then look at it and see if it's a higher number. And you want to continually go back and forth, checking your low number to your high number, just to make sure that you're increasing the, the frame per second. Because sometimes, if you get the video card too hot, then the temperature is outweighing the clock speed and you're actually getting a lower clock speed overall. It really is a game of cat and mouse of what is appropriate for your video card. So the reason why I recommend something like Heaven Benchmark is because it loops and it's a, pro it's a game or a program really. Unfortunately, it doesn't put a high enough load on the video card. So while it's a good indication of like what your video card could do, it's not going to be ideal because your video cards can still crash in other games. So that's why Combustor is the heaviest loading application you can find. It's heavier than any game. So if it doesn't crash in Combustor, most likely it's not going to crash in a game. I'm not trying to sell anything to anybody, but if you have access to 3D Mark's uh, benchmark program, I highly suggest getting it. A lot of times it's on sale for like $3 on Steam or what have you. And it's a great program to go with Combustor. Well, Combustor is free and you can always play your games to see if it crashes. I find that if I set my clock speeds correctly in Combustor and I run here and I go run a, a Time Spy or any of those benchmarks, Time Spy or Time Tech Extreme or any of these other ones, if it crashes in this, then it's going to crash in your game. Usually it'll crash here before it crashes in the game, which gives you an idea that mm, it's not 100% stable. Another way you can do is this stress test, which is basically you can pick the game you want, you run stress test, it does 20 loops, which takes, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes to do. 
once it does all 20 tests, it gives you a number from, you know, 95 to 100%. If it's 97% or higher, it means your card has passed. I like to do this after I've overclocked my video card to know that my video card is stable. But when you do overclock, I highly, highly suggest getting this program or any program that has an in-game benchmark. So Borderlands 3, Watch Dogs, uh, Assassin's Creed, there's tons of games that have in-game benchmarks. And you want to do is you want to set a default, run the benchmark, and then overclock it, and then run the benchmark again. And keep running the benchmark every time you up, up at 15. Because what's going to happen is that eventually either your video card's going to crash, the game's going to, you know, the driver's going to crash, the video card's going to crash, uh, you get a lower score, but nothing crashes. So that's kind of the tipping point. Now we're moving on to memory overclocking. And this is actually very, very tricky uh, because there's so many ways to do it and so many people have, I, I wouldn't say wrong ways of doing it. It's just not a clear cut. Unlike core clock where you just keep going until it crashes, you can have a very unstable memory clock and not crash the video card. And then you play a game and seemingly the game doesn't crash, but you'll end up at a lower frame rate because you're running into error messages or internally error messages in the video card. So there's many ways to do it. First, I do suggest running whatever benchmark you want, your game, your favorite game, your favorite benchmark, run it as stock, and then as you overclock the memory, keep running it and seeing when your clock, your, your frame rate drops or your score drops, then you can see that maybe your car is not stable, even though it's not crashing. That's the number one way I would suggest doing it. It's very tedious. I understand what you can do is just go online and see if somebody says, oh, I got 600 plus on my thing. Start at 600. You could start at 25 and work your way up. It'll take a very long time. I usually do is that because this is GDDR6 memory, I know that it can do... 16 gigabits, which would be plus 1,000. Because your clock speed for this car is 7,000 7, megahertz. Double that is 14. And then you add 1,000, it's now 8,000. Double that is 16. So that's how you get to 1,000. Now, I will say for this video card at least, 1,000 isn't 100% stable. After a while, I start getting artifacts. So when I did my review, I put it down to 800 because I know 800 is more stable. But I'm jumping ahead of myself. How do I get to 800? How do I even get to any number at all? Well, like I said, the first way is to just go up, type in 100, run your favorite benchmark, run this, you can run this application too, anything you want, and you just keep typing now, 200, and you don't want to instantly do it. You have to wait two or three minutes because I found that while you can type a number really quickly, it won't crash. When you get to the top end, when you get to like the thousand or whatever, and you type in a hundred, you know, eleven hundred, twelve hundred, it might not crash instantly, but it will after a few minutes. So you kind of have to play that game of waiting a minute or two to see if it crashes. Another thing I did, I didn't talk about this, is that I don't like to do any other. I like to raise my core temperature and all that, but I don't like to change my core clock speed because. This can influence your memory clock speed. And memory clock speed can influence your core clock speed. And what you want to do is you want to find the maximum of both individually. And then you want to go ahead and apply those to your benchmark, to your game, and kind of play with that. Once again, you want to type in 100 on your memory. You just keep going up, and then eventually it's going to crash your computer. There was an old method, which doesn't currently work right now, and I'm going to show you anyways because it might work in the future, and it usually does after I make a video six months later, it starts working. There's a little option here that says Artifact Scanner, and what it does is it, it just has an image, and it's the same image, and it's in the system memory or in the, game, in the program memory, and every time you just keep scanning it and scanning it and scanning it until it until it uh, detects errors. And I have a video of this, I'll play over it, but I don't want to crash my recording here. Uh, but once you go high enough, you'll start getting eight errors. Now what's wrong with this program right now is that once you hit that errors, if you if you clock it back down, the errors keep, keep showing up. And that's not supposed to happen. Usually when you, the way it normally works is when you clock it back down, the errors stop coming up, which gives you the indi indication of where the clock speed 
should be for the memory and how high it can possibly go. Other ways you can do is you can use programs like Heaven, and uh, this gives you a, an idea of what happens. So if you type in like 800 and you start seeing artifacts happening, then you can clock it back down. You can clock it up, and it kind of gives you an idea that maybe your thing's not quite stable. Once again, this program is okay for memory, but it's horrible for a clock speed, a core clock speed, because it doesn't put enough load on there. But at least for this, for memory, you can load it up, and it kind of gives you an idea what the what the clock speed for memory might be. Okay, so now we're at the end. I talked about how you can overclock your memory, overclock your core clock speed, how it works, how boost works, all that. You can always go back and look at what I was talking about earlier if it, it doesn't all make sense at the end or you skip to the end and you're now wondering how I got here. Either case, you can see that now I'm playing, I'm at 4K resolution and my clock speed is jumping between 1920 and 1935. And now let's apply everything we've done here. Um, there you go. So I have plus 90 and plus 800 because if I do 105, it'll crash the computer. If I do 1000, it crashes the computer. If I combine them, well, they don't crash the computer individually, but they will eventually. But if I combine them together, it'll crash the computer. So 90 plus 800, I go into the game, and now I have a clock speed of 2110. Basically, in my review, I said 2110, 2125 is kind of the limit. And it, once again, 100% depends on the game you're playing, resolution, clock speed, heat generated. Um, I'm also recording this video off this video card because my capture card is not currently working properly. And that also lowers your clock speed if you're recording at the same time. So if you're into like Call of Duty and all that and you have it tell it to record automatically the last five minutes, you will have a lower clock speed and lower frame rate because it's doing stuff in the background. Just, just to give you a tip there. Anyways, that concludes this video. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate when people leave comments and let me know the clock speed you got, how you got there, what video card you used, because to me, I find it very fascinating that, you know, you got a kingpin card and those things are expensive and you better expect something good out of them. You know, if you buy the cheapest blower cooler fan and you got a really high clock speed, that's really awesome also. I really want to see people, I want people to post what they have, let me know what your clock speed is and what game you tested it in because that will give me a great indication of what to expect in other video cards when I get around to reviewing them or when I'm comparing them. Anyways, thanks for watching. You have a great day.